Hi guys and welcome to today's video where I'll be sharing my review and first impressions of the Sennelier 12 half pan set. My birthday is on the 28th of December so this is technically like my Christmas and birthday gift combined. It came a little bit early today, um, the day of filming is the 1st of November so I'm pretty excited. I'm not going to wait around till Christmas to try this out. Um, I was so impressed with the other three half pants that I've ordered. The video of my first impressions of that will be linked in the comment down below. Basically, I ordered three half pants of Senelia, having never used the brand before, heard great things about it. Ordered three half pants, tried them, and I was very impressed. I am really pleased with the quality of the paint. So I decided I'm going to invest in this little kit. So it's kind of a, a gift from me to me, but also kind of my husband contributed. So yeah, thank you, babe. <laughs> That's great of you. So yeah, let's get into this. Okay, so first off, I really like the size. It's nice and compact for travel. It has a little thingy here for your finger so that when you're standing out in nature or painting, you can just hook your finger in there and your, your palette won't fall down. The other palettes that I have are, I've got this Lucas one that came without any half pans in. I've been filling it with half pans of my choice slowly over the past, I would say two years or so. The other palette that I have is a fairly large Cotman one which was the first time I experienced working with half pans. I mean, it's a really nice set, but it is student grade. So if I want to take some paints with me to travel and work on commissions at the same time or work with a bit of a nicer product, I think this would be a great solution for that. I did open this up earlier and take a peek. I quite like that they give you the color names on this little sheet. I'll probably do a little swatch thing that I might keep in here in the lid because these colors, they give you an idea of, of what you're dealing with, but it's very different from seeing it swatched out on the page. When I opened this earlier, one of these little pans had come dislodged. As you can see, they're quite loose, which isn't great, but I guess I could bend the metal a little bit to make it more sturdy, but that's not the end of the world. This thingy is removable. And that's how you get this piece of plastic out. Apparently, if you take this whole thing out, you can fill up this little tin with more half pans or even whole pans, full pans, I mean, or whatever you like. But I quite like having them kept in place and not sliding around and falling around inside the, the palette. So I'm probably not going to be removing this thing unless I really feel the need to downsize my travel palette and put more colors in here, then I'll probably take this thing out and just add an extra row of paint in the middle. Right, let's get to swatching. So I've prepared a page here with the color names, the color codes and the pigment codes that are in each paint. My handwriting is not the neatest, apologies for that, but I do have chronic nerve pain in my drawing hand and writing tends to make it so much worse. So, you know, where it's a bit untidy or I scratch things out or the, you know, if the layout isn't quite pleasing to the eye, apologies for that, but I'm not going to redo all of this because it would really hurt my hand. Painting is okay because it's not as, the, the fine muscle movement isn't as intense on my hand. So let's start swatching. They re-wet quite easily, or at least this first the lemon yellow is. Oh, it's so pretty. I already know that I like this brand from the three previous paints that I tried. The, um, the colors are very vibrant. They're nice and translucent. And of course the selling point with Sennelier, apart from the quality, is the fact that they, they use honey. Uh, a lot of people say this paint is ideal for glazing because it layers so nicely. The, the color range is quite decent. The quality is very nice. And the finish is lovely. Lemon yellow is quite potent, quite nice. I like it. Now the French Vermilion also re-wets very easily. I really like that in half pans because paint that doesn't re-wet easily. Oh wow, that's quite an intense color. Wow, I really dig it. Paint that doesn't wet down easily. Uh, you know, it's more work to get out of the pan, obviously, but that work is also bad for your brush. If you're using a natural bristle brush, any kind of friction on the brush bristles causes damage. It's just like, it's just like the hair on your head. The more you fiddle with it and the more you blow dry or tie it up or, you know, any friction on your hair causes damage. And I mean, what is this? 
other than actual hair. It's the same thing, so always handle your brushes with respect. Don't leave them in water, especially not upside down, gosh. The amount of times that I've seen people just chucking their brushes in a jar of water and leaving it upside down, that poor brush. It's not as bad with synthetics, I mean it's still bad, but with natural bristle it's basically it's the end of your brush <laughs> if you do that, so don't. Okay, very nice. Then uh, alizarin crimson, once again wetting down easily. If you have paint that struggles to come out of the pan, if it's quite dry and you have to put a little bit more elbow grease to reconstitute the paint, a very useful trick is to just use a spritzy bottle like this. Spray it into your uh, palette and it'll get your paint going for you so you don't have to do as much with your brush to get it out of there. But generally I'm a little nervous of doing that with you know, if it's not strictly necessary, I tend to avoid it because I do live by the coast and mold is an issue. So the less moisture I trap inside these things, the better, especially if it's ones that close. I like to leave my paints to dry out when I'm fairly sure they're dry. Then I'll close the lid on these palettes, but it's not going to help if there's moisture that I don't see. And I close the lid and when I get to my fancy paints, you know, mold has grown in it. That's basically also the end of your paint because mold is, yeah. You can't get rid of mold. It's like <laughs> it's like a curse. Once it's in there, it's in there, and you know you definitely don't want to be transferring that onto paintings that you're going to be giving to customers. Because if the moisture level in their home is just slightly too high, I mean that mold will start growing on the paper, and that's something you definitely don't want. Next color, carmine. Beautiful. I can already see myself using this for botanicals. If you guys hear anything in the background of this video, I apologize. It's very windy today and my neighborhood is not the quietest. I live next to a school and <laughs> everyone has a burglar alarm and when it's windy, yeah, all the noise comes out to play. Carmine is very nice. Definitely will be using this to do some floral paintings. My paper is already buckling. <laughs> I really should tape my paper more often, but eh, I'm so lazy. Don't tell anyone. This looks black. I mean, I know dark and purple is normally quite dark, but it legit looks black in the pan. I don't know if you guys can see this very well, but I mean, that looks like black. I actually had to just paint a little bit on this tissue to just to make sure that it is actually purple and that the uh, half pants didn't somehow get scrambled in transit. But I mean, wow, look at this. Like this gentian violet kind of. Doxazine purple is just one of those colors that <laughs> you don't want to get it on your clothes or on anything really because it's very staining. And um, if it ends up getting mixed into a different color on your palette, it's, yeah, it's over for the color you're mixing because this tends to just take over. I have made some very nice blue mixes with this before. I was painting a bird and it didn't have exactly the right kind of rich blue. So I added some of this purple to, I believe it was um, ultramarine and one other thing and it made a very, very lovely blue, perfect color for the bird that I was painting. Yep, there's another hot pans rattling around. Ultramarine deep. Once again, wetting down very easily. Oh, not a very punchy ultramarine, let me get some more paint on here. That's a bit better. As far as ultramarines go, this is not the most intense one I've ever worked with, but that is a thing with Sennelier that I've heard is that it tends to be more transparent and glaze friendly than other brands. So I'm sure that if you use this ultramarine and you glaze another layer on top of it, it'll be every bit as punchy as any other professional brand. I don't hate it though. I mean, it is useful to have an ultramarine that is punchy and one that is not as punchy, depending on the applications you have for it. No paint is a wasted paint. I mean, in the spectrum of colors there exists in the world, it's just, you know, everything has a use and everything has a place. So, right. Thalo Blue. This is one of my favorite colors and I'm sure 
a lot of people's favorite colors because it's so rich and so bright and just such a such a juicy fresh color once again straight off the pan not as punchy as some other solo blues that I've used but um, as you can see when I added that little second drop of paint I mean look this is it's still very bright and very beautiful let's add some water Thalo blue is just so great and the nice thing about Thalo blue is you can mix it with a whole range of other colors to get some beautiful shades oh gosh a little drop of blue fell on my next half I'm just gonna dab that off otherwise we might get a tinted green okay the next color is forest green wow that is rich oh that's beautiful it's like the darkest green in a peacock feather this is what I would solidly define as a jewel tone if you're looking at jewel tone decor this be oh wow look how dark that is it almost looks black I'm not sure how it's showing up on camera I won't be able to see until I play back the footage but um, trust me off camera it's a brilliant brilliant beautiful green gosh look at that it's actually <laughs> I might have actually put a bit too much on here I'm like covering up my written section here wow I really dig it nice I'm gonna have so much fun with this palette you guys and I've already dripped some color into my next <laughs> half pan okay so phthalo green light is the next one so far none of these have struggled to reconstitute they've all wetted on very easily which is great great news for my brushes and great news for my patients very nice bright green like a may green or a spring spring green I actually wonder if Schmincke's May Green is the same pigment. Let me just grab it and see. May Green is uh, pigment PY151 and PG7. Well, there's PG7 in this, but PY151 is different. This is PY153. So close, visually very close, but not exactly the same formula. But also super, super potent and punchy. It's so satisfying when you're painting and the color payoff is really intense it just makes me feel so good I don't know why <laughs> I guess it's a it's like a I don't know maybe it's a painter's fetish or something maybe that's like maybe I can start a kink site where people just literally swatch all day demonetized well oh dear the burnt sienna is not very really strong well let's see maybe I can work some more out of this half pan hmm this isn't really what I look for in a burnt sienna. Funny enough, the best burnt sienna to me that I have tried so far, and I haven't tried a whole lot of paint brands, but Cotman, Winsor & Newton's Cotman burnt sienna is beautiful. The Holbein one comes very close, and if I need burnt sienna of that nature with a similar tone to the Cotman one, I'll probably use Holbein. Um, I mean, I know I said before that I feel like Holbein is a little bit chalky, but their burnt sienna really isn't, it's beautiful. Not even the Winsor Newton Professional Burnt Sienna is quite the same visually as the Cotman, even though it's the same manufacturer. So Holbein, I guess, is my favorite Burnt Sienna so far. The Daniel Smith one is also not really what I look for. I mean, it's a nice color, but I like a very red toned, and maybe not red toned, maybe more dark orange toned Burnt Sienna. That's what I like. This is a little bit too transparent, too light for me. But once again, it's not a bad color, and no color is wasted. I'll definitely have a use for this. But if I had to choose a burnt sienna to place in a palette, I would probably get a half pan. I don't know if Holbein does half pans. I probably do. I think they do. They must. I'll probably get a Holbein half pan of burnt sienna because that is just such a nice color. It's very punchy. Oops, a cat hair. <laughs> the hazards of living with cats is that the air in your home is 50% cat hair. Wow, this Payne's Grey is pretty dang intense. Oh, I love it. This is great. This is a beautiful Payne's Grey. I remember the first time I discovered Payne's Grey, I was probably in high school. I think I had a tube of gouache or something, but I used to use gouache like watercolor. I never really used gouache uh, for its opacity. I always just watered it down and used it like watercolor because I didn't know any better. YouTube wasn't around when I was in high school, so. <laughs> You guys have it good but it looked a little bit like this and 
I fell in love with it the moment I started using it because it's just so pretty. Such a versatile color. It's like an upgraded black. If you need to use black in something, you can try and use paint gray instead. And it'll give you that little bit of an extra oomph factor to your painting. A lot of people don't believe in using black. I do use black for things like eyes and small details. I don't like overusing black. If you see me painting a pet or an animal or something and you see areas that are supposed to be red as black, it's usually a kind of a gray that I use. But then for things like the deep shadows inside the nostrils and, you know, the pupils and very, very deep shadows where I just need a little bit of detail to pop. Um, I will probably use black for that. And quite often I use ink with a dipping nib if it's like a really fine little area that I need to fill in. Warm sepia, just a nice standard warm brown. This isn't the most exciting color to me, but like I said, every color has a use. I will probably use this if I paint pet portraits or nature scenes. Hmm. Bernciana is drying very similarly to the Windsor and Newton one. It's got like a little bit of granulation. Hmm. I'm not used to just talking to a camera, by the way. So if I sound a little awkward or a little uh uh, the stuttery or anything, <laughs> it's just me <laughs> trying to learn the ropes of how to actually be a person on camera that's entertaining and interesting to listen to. And I know I'm probably not the best out there at that, but I mean, I try. And just for fun, I'm going to be swatching the other three little half pans that I have from Cinelio. Because this page is going to go into my watercolor file. And if you guys are interested in seeing a video where I give you a tour of my, my watercolor reference file, I will link that below as well. But it's something I recommend everybody who paints. It's a very, very useful tool. It helps you keep track of what brands um, you use and what, you know, the particular properties of that brand. And if you've got a color that you want to use and you can't remember which brands, you know, for example, Burnt Sienna you like the most, you can just quickly grab your file, have a look and off you go. Because obviously the color is printed on the tubes and on the, on the packaging really really reflect the true nature of the paint. The colors that I bought as singles were quinacridone gold, indigo and warm gray and I was so impressed with them. So much so that I invested in this little 12 color half pan set which I don't know how overseas prices are but in South Africa it wasn't cheap. <laughs> it was a uh, pricey. Okay uh, indigo I believe it's this one. Oh yes, their indigo is very blue. It's a very turquoisey, turquoisey tinted kind of indigo. To me, indigo is closer to this paint gray than this. But this is a beautiful color as well. I mean, I will definitely use this. But if I want indigo proper, I'll probably go with a different brand. Quite like Daniel Smith's indigo. Swatching is so much fun, you guys. Why is it so much fun? It's like so therapeutic. If you're having a bad day, I can recommend trying to freshen up your swatch collection or just, if you've never done it, definitely please do yourself a favor and swatch out your paint collection. It feels so good. <laughs> I can't explain it. It's um, just this mindless exercise that kind of, it just helps you feel like accomplished when you're done. I don't know. like. You see this beautiful little patchwork of rainbows and you feel like, yeah, I did that. Oops. I guess it's just a good feeling to see beautiful colors and knowing you had a hand in producing it somehow, no matter how small. Now I've got to leave my palettes open so they can dry because I don't want mold. If you guys are wondering, the brush I'm using is the... Um, Escoda Reserva Kalinski hmm, Tajmir, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, number six, I got this brush off Jet Pens and I am very happy with the performance. I actually got them because I'm, I grabbed the Escoda, the travel brushes. 
and I have been very impressed with their performance so I thought why stick to just travel brushes when I can get a nice wooden handled regular brush as well so I grabbed some okay so I'm gonna let this dry and I will be back I guess tomorrow maybe to do a little paint test I put up a poll on Twitter asking what you guys would like me to paint so far between the choice of animal and plants I think animals winning but I will get back to you guys with my final test when the poll results are in. Thank you so much. I will see you guys in a bit.